Yes. Yeah, so, uh, Natalie, thanks for joining us. You know, really interesting. All the stuff about uh, Ashley Biden's lap, uh, not laptop. Sorry again, Ashley Biden's diary, not laptop. You said you had Hunter Biden's laptop too, but uh, really, really kind of interesting. We had um, we had actually had James O'Keefe in our office the other week talking about some of the stuff. Can you give me kind of the background to the story where uh, you know? You had a, a, a lawyer pushing out subpoenas who's connected to Cuomo and all this kind of stuff. What kind of let's get to the bottom of that there. Sure. There are definitely a lot of kind of moving parts and key players and even the timeline is sort of confusing to follow. But there's really one key takeaway that I think everyone, but particularly people who aren't part of the kind of Democratic Party elite should really be concerned about. And that is that really Democrats, really the Biden regime, which is what we like to call it at the National Pulse, they are keen on weaponizing America's legal system, whether it be subpoenas, even prosecutions and criminal referrals um, against people that they disagree with. In this case with Project Veritas is probably the latest and I would say one of the most glaring examples. So to go back a little bit to kind of contextualize the whole the whole situation, Project Veritas had obtained a copy of Ashley Biden's personal diary, not to be confused with Hunter Biden's hard drive, um, during the days, the early days of the campaign. Um, and there were some interesting kind of entries in there talking about allegedly inappropriate showers with Joe Biden, among other things, and obviously and who a is personal Ashley Biden, like how she sure. in the family so she is, niece. Uh, she's the daughter, daughter okay. of Joe yeah. Biden. Jo- daughter Joe, okay. Yes. And sibling then, therefore, to, to Hunter Biden and mm-hmm. uh, the deceased Bo Biden. So that's how she, I think she's in her probably late 30s. I could be wrong on that, but I would estimate about that age. Mm-hmm. Um, but this diary obviously contained a lot of personal information. And you can kind of see an email exchange that Project Veritas released going back and forth between Ashley Biden's attorneys and the Project Veritas team, um, where the Project Veritas people, including James O'Keefe, were trying to get an interview with Joe Biden, then candidate Joe Biden, um, to talk about the contents of the diary. And it's actually very funny. I think it gives you some good insight uh, into what the left thinks, you know, journalism is, because when they were offered an interview or when Project Veritas tried to get an interview with Joe Biden about the contents of this diary, they likened it to basically extortion and they refused no interviews, no interviews. And you could tell they were obviously very upset. So in terms of now, when we talk about the subpoenas in this angle of the story, uh, you can see an individual who's named Roberta Kaplan. Um, People may know her. She was a pretty big time lawyer in the Me Too movement. Mm -hmm. Um, But she's also represented a lot of high profile Democrats, including Andrew Cuomo um, and one of his top aides. And she was actually, despite being involved in the Me Too movement, very closely linked to Cuomo's efforts to actually disparage um, some of his accusers of sexual assault. So it's, you know, it's really a political tactic at this point. It yes, seems, I mean, yes. a- after everything we saw with Andrew Cuomo last summer, then, you know, he eventually resigns. Maybe he's actually running for governor of New York again. It's, you know, it's kind of let the air out of the bag with that whole me too movement, I think. Exactly. And, and this individual, I think is just the perfect example of how all these kind of astroturfed social movements aren't really about, you know, social justice at all. They're about power and trying to take down Political your enemies. Political means, yeah. Exactly. And this story about the, the Project Veritas subpoena is just kind of another iteration of that. So Rob, Roberta Kaplan was also the attorney um, for Ashley Biden. So that's why she was kind of looped in on this whole matter. She was trying to ostensibly not get this diary leaked um, any more than, than some of the entries that had already became public. Um, But where it gets really interesting, um, if it's not interesting enough already, is that she also is the personal attorney uh, to the daughter-in-law of the then acting U.S. attorney for the Southern District of New York, the person who had the power to authorize the subpoenas against Project Veritas. And -hmm. what's so interesting about it is that you can see in the emails, Roberta Kaplan actually said, and this is a direct quote, we should send to the SDNY. So basically, the story, as Project Veritas kind of uh, alleges, and just I think as common sense sort of pieces together, um, is that you had these kind of key Democratic lawyer, progressive lawyer types Mm -hmm. um, who are all connected with the Biden family, the Cuomos, and of course, even familially related uh, to the person who is then authorizing subpoenas against Project Veritas in just about two, three weeks after that email, the one where she basically says, let's refer this to the SDNY, um, 
that was what happened. And the yeah. first of 19 subpoenas were authorized. Secret at that. And we've got this really nice graphic that you guys uh, had in the article. We're going to put that up on the screen. Uh, but, yeah, just the, it really shows how they're all so, you know, connected. They all know each other. You know, obviously, you know, they're talking to you. The emails, they're talking about that. But these subpoenas. So it's uh, Audrey Strauss is the person who ended up authorizing the subpoenas. So that's really just essentially, uh, you know, the court saying or this um, this attorney saying you be quiet to Project Veritas, right? That was the point of yeah. all those. Yeah. And remember, this is the same, you know, Project Veritas that James O'Keefe saw his house raided, um, you know, his, his contents and, and all these things seized. Meanwhile, you know, even Rudy Giuliani's house was raided by SDNY, but they wouldn't take Hunter Biden's hard drive. So I really think this story, while it's very easy to get lost in the weeds, and I think that graphic kind of explains it a little better than, than maybe I can, I think the takeaway from this really is just how all of these people in positions of power, particularly in the legal system, really are kind of just the shock troops of some of the big players in the Democratic Party. I think you've probably heard you know, a lot about these Soros-funded DAs in states across the country, um, but it even goes down to kind of the district levels. And even up in New York, I think it really just represents how l the legal system and even criminal referrals and prosecutions, and in this case, subpoenas, um, are being used against political opponents, which is really something out of the, the Chinese Communist Party's handbook. Certainly. And I think this kind of speaks to the broader politicization and the weaponizing of our institutions in America today. I think you, you see this, especially federally, uh, with like the... Um, with the DOJ and the, you know, Colin Parent's domestic terrorist letter they wrote there. It's almost like there's this institutional rot that's going on in our justice system. And you've, you're reporting on it firsthand. Totally. And, and mm -hmm. it's definitely institutional rot, but I think it's even more malicious than that, right? Because it's mm -hmm. not that these institutions are failing their duties to protect Americans or neglecting, you know, national security. They're just basically redefining what national security means. And I think it's really interesting that the Disinformation Governance Board, the very short-lived one that was recently scrapped, one out. that was set, right? That was set up at the Department of Homeland Security, which is really yes. curious because that's the same agency that was going after parents who oppose CRT, people who are skeptical of COVID-19 vaccines, when in reality, that agency should be going after actual domestic terrorists, not playing these kind of word games that the left, like, the left likes to do with, you know, gender and, and whatnot. But it seems like they're even trying to bring that um, to really the legal system um, and what it even means to be a criminal, what it means, and, and in this case, particularly with Project Veritas, to even be a journalist. There was a lot of kind of back and forth um, over whether or not authorities actually thought that James O'Keefe was a journalist. And given our founding, that's a really, really concerning prospect that the government gets to decide who is a journalist and who is not. Exactly. And it's you got all these institutions just, you know, covering for, uh, you know, Joe Biden's past, anything, you know, he might have done there. Uh, but, you know, what is it that we can actually do about this? You know, I, I'm just let's go back to the, like the disinformation board. Obviously, they scrapped that plan. But, you know, we've got to be on the lookout for another one coming down the pike in the future. Uh, you know, they're, you know, that's how they operate in the federal government. They will start up a program here. And then if, you know, if it meets some resistance, it, these things never go away. The gravy train's never going away with federal programs. What can we do to, you know, keep, keep these bureaucrats out of power? You, I mean, sure, we can elect, uh, you know, elect Republicans to Congress, uh, you know, get a Republican president. But we haven't been able to slow down, uh, you know, the gears here. What do you think? I mean, that's a very difficult question, but I think we have to find hope in the fact that because the stories about the clear, clear, clear cut partisanship of Nina Jankowitz was shared so far and wide, I think that really played a key role um, in the termination or at least temporary um, pause of that board. So I think we really should use that incident kind of as a, a case study or a model going forward. Um, you're definitely right. Anytime these federal agencies are, are created, Every year, they only seem to balloon in, in power and budget. So it's really important to have them not be created in the first place. But I think the most important thing people can do is be informed themselves because, you know, our, our elites, the people like Roberta Kaplan, the people who want to weaponize the, the justice system against people like you, um, you know, the, the best, I think, kind of remedy to that is, is knowing what they're up to. And believe me, they hate that more than anything. 
Um, so I think that's definitely part of it. And just talking to people who maybe are, aren't even into politics, because I think that's what's really going on here, is that it's kind of the, I think, the political aspect of society now is really bleeding over into everything, right? Something that 10, 20 years ago, maybe you know, under the Obama administration, it was, it was you know, commonplace. But the weaponization of, you know, the Southern District of New York and courts against Americans just because they disagree with you politically, that's sort of a new a new trend, I, I would argue. Um, yeah, and, and I think and that's I, what the yeah. left's been pushing for for years here is making everything a political issue. And it's about time the conservatives mm-hmm. finally figured out a way to, you know, get involved in this. Because like you said, when you when you talk about this to normal people, they look at this and they think it's crazy. For so long, they've been like, oh, you know, I don't like I don't like either side. You got to actually point out that you have some pretty terrible things going on with the left these days and you know they might be all you know all happy all the time there's some pretty awful things going on and when you start exposing that to kind of the middle to like you know maybe the normal people people figure out it's pretty bad but what you're saying well no you're you're exactly right because i think people think if they're independent they don't have to have politics enter their life right it's mm-hmm. not a choice but, I, but at the point in you. which it's coming for you now exactly yeah if you live in the southern district of new york who's to say that because you're you know hesitant of getting a COVID 19 vaccine that tomorrow you're not going to be branded as a domestic terrorist so i think it's just important your, to have your credit card is going to be exp- um uh, the social credit, credit score is coming. Yeah, exactly. You know, <laughs> we've seen this happen. <laughs> we know we know where we're going here. But uh, so speaking of elites, too, you've also been covering uh, the World Economic Forum, right? Yes. Talk a little a bit lot, about that. A lot going. There's a lot sure. going on. <laughs> yeah, I know our all of our elites planning our future without any in- input from from any of us. Um, mm-hmm. But that seems to be how they like it. I mean, You know, I encourage people to watch as painful and scary as it is to watch panels from the World Economic Forum, because it it is really interesting to see how these people think and how desperate they are to control your future. And I I promise every I would say five minutes, there'll probably be a quote that you will be your your jaw will be at the floor because you can't believe these people are saying these things. Just uh, two days ago, we had an individual who runs all of Australia's kind of e-safety um, regulations calling for a quote recalibration of human rights, including free speech. Um, she that. also used to work <laughs> at, at Twitter, so no surprise there. Um, but I, I think the takeaway from the World Economic Forum um, is really just also too. Uh, you know, there are hundreds of companies and corporate partners of this event. Um, obviously, you know, Pfizer, Johnson and Johnson, all these big pharmaceutical companies, but even Amazon, Walmart. Um, companies that you, you know, even though you try not to, you probably use every day. And I think that the World Economic Forum is kind of the best example of it's the quiet part out loud. You really can see how all these titans of industry um, and these kind of NGOs, left wing social groups work in concert with big business and even politicians. There's people from the Biden um, regime there. There's also Republican elected officials there. I think there's about a little under two dozen. Um, So I think it's just really interesting to see who's there and what they want to what they want to do with with your future and just keep in mind how secretive and duplicitous these people are we put up a story uh yesterday about how the world economic forum their website they've actually been deleting files um that show that former officials from wuhan again the city that COVID 19 comes from Mm -hmm. um attending their events so again uh you know there's still more to that story that we're getting to the bottom bottom of, but it just makes you really wonder why the World Economic Forum would be being so secretive with their ties to Wuhan. So I really encourage people to watch the World Economic Forum because nine times out of ten, you know, these people will tell you who they are. You don't have to listen to a paraphrased version of it, um, and it really is as, as scary uh, as it sounds. Yeah, well, that's it, that's incredible. But you're going to be the one who's going to let us know uh, what the plan is, <laughs> what their plan is for monkeypox, right? Oh, yes, that's that's well, I think they realized the new coronavirus variant. People are kind of fatigued with all that. So they had to <laughs> gen up a new a new virus. And believe it or not, we actually put up a story a few days ago. Um, the Wuhan Institute of Virology, they published a quarterly journal. And in their most recent edition, they'd actually published a study. This was in the end of February of this year, uh, where they were actually assembling strains of monkeypox. I kid you not. Mm. Um, so they could do PCR tests, um, uh, with the virus because they didn't have any strains endemic to China since the virus uh, is from Congo. There are a couple of different strains, but it comes from Africa. Um, so again, 
you know, there's more to the story there, but it's all very, very, very curious. And when you see how kind of tied together all these elements of society are from kind of the scientific industrial complex to big pharma to mm -hmm. these elected officials all at the World Economic Forum, it really, really, I think, makes you start to, to wonder. Even like the Project Veritas story, it's just kind of a, a messy conflict of interest, kind of tangled web um, of, of interest to, believe me, do not have limited government or personal liberty uh, anywhere near the forefront of their mind. Yeah. It's almost like just the tip of the iceberg. You hear about one of these things and you unpack it like you did with this story, and there's just so much there. But anyway, uh, you know, Natalie, uh, thanks for coming on. This was so interesting. Uh, we'll definitely put the link out for our viewers and that nice uh, that nice graphic where it puts all the people together <laughs> in the, uh, the, not the flow chart, but the uh, links them all together there. But Natalie, thanks for coming on. Thank you so much for having me. Take care.